Today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 2, starting at verse 46 through Daniel 3. I call the name of this lesson, Fiery Trials. Our last study closed with Daniel telling King Nebuchadnezzar his dream and the interpretation of the dream. And with Daniel saying to him in verse 45, the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. Daniel was telling the king what was going to happen anywhere from 70 to 2,500 years in the future. A lot of it is now in our past and confirmed to us by history books that it happened just exactly as Daniel said it was going to happen. But hey, the best is yet to come. The kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm saving that lesson for later because it is so grand and it will take a while to talk about that, probably several studies, but that one is the stone kingdom uh, that he talked about in chapter 2. We can know by past prophecy that all of that is going to be fulfilled. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Next, something happened that probably took Daniel by complete surprise. I mean, he had just told this king that his kingdom is going to be taken away from him. And Daniel may have been expecting him to say, oh, you're going to be cut to pieces. That seemed to be Nebuchadnezzar's first thought of what to do when things didn't go his way to cut them to pieces and make their house a dunghill. <laughs> we see that twice in the first three chapters. But instead, Nebuchadnezzar falls down and worships Daniel and commands that sacrifices be made to him. Daniel 2, verses 46 through 49. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. This is a sacrifice. Maybe deep down the king really does want to know the one true God, and he is getting little glimpses of him through Daniel. You know, there's an empty place in all of us that only, only, only God can fill. It's true in our day, and it's been true since the very beginning of time. God made us that way. What Nebuchadnezzar searched for is God, and eventually he will find him. No one can fill the empty place in our heart but God. Nebuchadnezzar fell down on his face and worshipped Daniel, but did Daniel accept this worship? Um, in the past, I've just taken everybody else's word for it, but I got to looking at it a little closer, and... Um, I prayed about it. I went to some commentaries about it. And I can tell you some of the most brilliant minds that ever were disagree on it. <laughs> so uh, this is something you're going to have to study for yourself. Clarence Larkin and Dr. Peter Ruckman, they disagree, as do others. Matthew Henry disagrees with Dr. Ruckman. And, um, <laughs> so it's something you're going to have to pray about. The Holy Spirit may show you something about the verse that they didn't see or something I didn't see. God speaks to each of us who seek Him. God will show us stuff. Uh, you may think, well, I'm not as smart as they are. I'll just take their word for it. Oh, no, no, no. You better search that scripture for yourself. Each of us go through things at different times in our lives that when we read the Bible, God's going to show us something He doesn't show anybody else. It won't change the basic doctrine or the basic teachings of the Bible, but it may be a very big spiritual application that we need to hear. So search the Scripture for yourself. But when I prayed um, about it, the words that spoke to my heart, said, you know what, Pammy, <laughs> it should make no difference to you what Daniel did in that situation. What matters is what you know is right to do and what you would do in that situation. And I said, mm-hmm, you're right. <laughs> For the record, 
I don't think Daniel accepted the worship. I wouldn't hold it against him if he did. We all make mistakes. We all have fallen. And if you think you haven't, then you have fallen a bit further than the rest of us have who know we have fallen. <laughs> we don't have an account of Daniel protesting Nebuchadnezzar's worship, but we don't see that he accepted it either. Why not just think the best of him unless we're told specifically otherwise? Why not just think the best always of people anyway? The sacrifice was commanded to be brought to Daniel, but we don't ever see that it was. Maybe in between verse 46 and verse 47, maybe that's when Daniel protested and said something like, Stand up. I'm just a man. It's God only that we should worship. It seems Daniel must have said something that turned the king's thoughts toward the direction of God because the next verse says, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. The king in verse 47 speaks of the Trinity of God without even knowing what he's saying when he says, Your God is a God of gods, that would be God the Father, a Lord of kings, that would be God the Son, a revealer of secrets, that would be God the Holy Spirit. You know if God can put words in a donkey's mouth, he can certainly put thoughts and words in a lost man's mouth. Nebuchadnezzar is speaking of God, <coughs> of God as a God, though. Daniel's God here, but in chapter 4, he becomes Nebuchadnezzar's God also. And that's about 20 years later, I think, if I'm correct on that. If people I've been reading after are correct on that. So verse 48, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. That means Daniel was Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man. It was not by accident that Daniel arose to that high position. In chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had had the dream that there would be four worldwide kingdoms of which Babylon was number one. We have lived to see that. History confirms it. There was Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. Four, just like the Bible told us there would be. Rome was never conquered. It fell slowly from conflicts within, and it just sort of faded into history. No actual date can be set for an ending, and the reason being that there never was one, because one day it will rise again under the revision of the worldwide rule of the Antichrist. Concerning Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel had told him that he was that head of gold that represented Babylon. After the interpretation of the dream, Nebuchadnezzar was thinking the God of Daniel was the highest God. But then about 16 to 20 years later, chapter 3 takes place. During those years, Nebuchadnezzar had taken Jerusalem two more times, the last time he had taken the majority of the people and the vessels of the temple, and the third time he had burned the temple and left the land desolate. So now he must be thinking Daniel's God is not the highest God after all to have let him get away with that, burning the temple. Little did he know that um, all of that was all in God's plan and he's not getting away with it. 
God is the one who sets up kings and puts them down and arranges everything in between. And we learn all about that in the book of Daniel 2. We're told in the Bible that God uses Babylon to chastise his people, and then he's going to destroy Babylon for doing it, and he does. In chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar gets to thinking of himself as a god. He is pretty puffed up in pride now. He is a worldwide ruler. He's taken everything. Everything around him has been conquered. And um, he's just thinking pretty much of himself right now. So Daniel 3 verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now this image was about 90 feet tall, and the plain of Dura was flat, where you could see all the people out there, and if there were three people standing up when everybody else bowed, you're going to see them. So we can be pretty sure the image was a monument to himself because everything in chapter 3 pictures what will happen during the tribulation when Antichrist comes to power. Nebuchadnezzar pictures the Antichrist. The Jews in Babylon picture the remnant who will go through the tribulation. The image size was three score cubits by six cubits since only the height and the width are given, it's thought that the image was shaped like a cylinder with the width being the same as the breadth. So you would have 60 by 6 by 6, three sixes in a row, 666. Remind you of anything? Nebuchadnezzar made the image of gold. At the sound of music, everyone was to fall down and worship the image, and whoever did not was to be thrown into a fiery furnace. It was told to the king that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had not bowed to worship the image. He was enraged, but called for them to give him another chance, and that's kind of surprising. But I guess he liked these guys. He knew the wisdom of them. He knew about the God they worshipped. So he gave them another chance. He told them again that if they don't worship the golden image, you're going to be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And their answer was, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They said, we aren't careful to answer you about this. They're saying, we're not filled with care about our answer. We're not worried about it. They didn't even have to think about what their answer would be. Their answer would be, no, we're not going to bow down to your image. It amazes me today that with all that is in God's word about not bowing to an image from the very first of God's word all the way through it, it says, do not bow to an image, do not bow, do not bow. It amazes me that people today in certain religions still bow down in front of cement statues without giving it a second thought. I mean, read the Bible, folks. Our God will deliver us, but if he doesn't, notice they had faith and they had doubt, but they stepped out on the faith they had and they did not bow to that image. I heard a sermon once by Dr. Jack Hiles in which he gave the recipe for faith, and it was this, believing, doubting, but stepping out on the belief you have. And there have been many throughout the Bible who have demonstrated that recipe. Some think, oh, you got to have a large amount of faith to get your prayers answered. Hmm, no, you don't. The father of the sick child in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, didn't. He said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I believe, help thou my unbelief. <laughs> he believed, but he doubted it. But he stepped out on his belief and asked Jesus to heal his child anyway. And he was blessed with the answer he wanted. 
Peter had enough belief to step out and try walking on that water. He stepped out, uh, but he, he looked away from the Lord and he started sinking. But hey, he walked on water for a while. None of the others did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Our Lord will deliver us, but if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow to your gods. When some start talking about the faith it takes to get your prayers answered, think about this. Think about this. It actually takes more faith to trust God to work things out His way than to trust God to work things out the way we'd have him to do it. He knows what's best for us. He knows what's on down the road ahead of us. God knows. We just think we want something so bad, and it ends bad for us lots of times. It actually takes more faith to trust God to work things out His way than to trust God to work things out the way we'd have Him to do it. Don't beat yourself up when you know your faith is weak. Just go ahead and step out on whatever amount of faith you have. Moses did. Gideon did. Peter did along with many, many, many others, and they were blessed for it. You will be too. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and demanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. The most mighty men he had were commanded to bind them and cast them into the fire. The flame of the fire was so hot that it killed the men that were casting them into it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. And I'm thinking when they fell down, they probably stayed down for a while and worshipped the one who met them there. God will meet you in your trials too. He has met me many, many times. When they fell down, they were bound, but next they were seen loose and walking in the midst of the fire by King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 24 and 25, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the fourth, well, let me back up. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The king called to the three Hebrews to come forth. King Nebuchadnezzar said, They have yielded their bodies that they might not serve or worship any god except their own god. They are promoted, in verse 30, to a high position in the province of Babylon. Our verse today that is equivalent to that statement, is they have yielded their bodies, is found in Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The heathen see more in the life of a Christian than we think they do. People are dying to see a real Christian. What we claim to be true seems too good to be true, but they'd still love to see it. The world wants to know that it's real. It's real. What we believe or say we believe is real, but too many Christians act as if it's not. But not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had purposed in their hearts to continue to serve God. And with each trial that came their way, the veil of faith um, was removed just a little bit more from their eyes. And they were able to see God a little more clearly. We have a thin veil over our eyes today spiritually. 
if we could just see all the things going on around us, wow. But by faith, we know, we know God sends angels to watch over us and take care of us. We know Jesus is with us. There's so much happening that we would be able to see a little bit more clearly if we'd get in the Word, stay in the Word, keep our eyes on Jesus. It happens the same for us in little ways as we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord and give God first place in our life. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. That's such a beautiful song. Jesus said to the disciples in John 14 verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. We're not going to keep them perfectly, but he is pleased when he sees that we try, and he will help us. You're not going to visibly see him, but you're sure going to know he's there with you. My two oldest grandsons love a certain verse in Isaiah 43, and both of them have shared it with me at different times. And boy, did it make my heart happy when they did. Isaiah 43 two says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. In his Daniel commentary, Dr. Ruckman calls our attention to the fact that the fourth man did not come out of the fire. And he tells the story that a children's Sunday school teacher asked her class, Why do you think the Son of God stayed in the fire? And a little girl answered, so that he would be there when we have to go through the fire. And he said, that's the best answer we'll ever hear. Jesus is there in the fire to get us through it when it's our turn. And we'll all have our turn in some way or another. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of that furnace, their hair was not singed, their clothes weren't burnt, and they did not even have the smell of smoke on them. Daniel and these three Hebrews kept praising God no matter what. Every time God showed himself in some way to either of these men, I'm sure they just couldn't wait to tell each other how God manifested himself to them this time. Daniel was like, let me tell you how God saved me from those lions. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, (laughs) would answer, well, let me tell you about that fiery furnace. I bet they told those stories over and over and over again to each other. Oh, and you should have seen Nebuchadnezzar's face when he saw us walking around in that furnace. Listen, there were pagans all around these guys overhearing their conversations without them even realizing it. They were being influenced toward accepting the Hebrews' God as their God. These special Jewish boys were planting seeds that were giving others their first thoughts of God that would one day be the cause of them turning to belief in the God, in our God. We need to be careful too about our conversations that are being overheard by others. We need to always let others be blessed by our words. These had decided before the bad times came what they'd do. They presented their bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord earlier before the trials came, and they continued to do so in the trials. In their time of pain and sorrow through every bad experience, they grew stronger, more courageous, and through their sufferings, they saw God more clearly and his presence was felt more than 
ever before and their love for him grew stronger and stronger and stronger because they were getting to know him and those around them were able to get true glimpses of the one true God. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. They were human for a while. They may have thought God has deserted us. He has withdrawn himself from us. I'm sure it seemed that way, but Daniel too had already purposed in his heart to continue believing in God. And the others followed his example, or maybe he followed theirs, whichever way it was. I know they were strengthened by each other. It wasn't long until their belief was rewarded with sight. I hope you have good Christian friends that you lift each other up and that um, your faith is made stronger by their faith. The world says seeing is believing, but God wants us to believe in order to see. Faith is to believe what we do not see, what we do not feel. It is to decide with our will to simply believe, and the reward of that faith is to see what we believe. Our faith will allow us to see God in the lion's dens of our lives or in the fiery furnaces of our lives. We may not see it right then. We may not see him or feel him right then, but I'll guarantee you when you look back, you're going to know, oh yeah, <laughs> that was God with me through that. I would not have made it through if he had not been there with me. Back up in Daniel 3.25, the king had said of the four men he had seen loose walking in the fire that the fourth is the form like the Son of God. Now, why would Nebuchadnezzar think that? How can Nebuchadnezzar know anything about that? For one thing, I'm sure he overheard those conversations of those Jewish people in his kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar probably had had talked a lot with the Hebrews about their God. He was also acquainted with the prophet Jeremiah and his prophecies. I'm sure he talked in great lengths to all of these about God because Nebuchadnezzar was always wanting to add one more God to his collection of gods. And from what he had seen of theirs, this was truly a great God to be added no doubt, I would think after chapter 2, when Daniel had been promoted to be King Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man, oh my, he probably talked Daniel's ear off asking questions. They probably spent lots and lots of time talking about Daniel's God. The king had said to Daniel in chapter 2, verse 47, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. Don't you know the king had questions for Daniel about God? But here he's still speaking of him as being a God, not the God. The Gentiles would have already known of the miracles associated with Israel's departure from Egypt. Everyone in that area knew how little old Israel had won battles and fought giants. I'm sure they all knew about the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6. Daniel might have told the king what another king, King Solomon, had written in Proverbs 30 verse 4 when he said, Who hath established all the ends of the earth, what is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell. But still, what would make Nebuchadnezzar say the fourth man in the fire was the form like the Son of God? I don't know, except that God does choose to reveal certain things to certain people at certain times, especially to heathen people, to pagan people who have not been as privileged as the Jews were who had grown up having the knowledge of God taught to them every day. And as we in the United States have been privileged and uh, to that privilege for us is added that we have our very own copies of God's word. It will be a sad, sad day when rewards are handed out at the judgment seat of Christ when we're reminded 
that to those of us who have been given much, much shall be required. It is so simple nowadays to share the gospel with others. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, gospel tracts, so many ways, so many easy ways. You don't even have to open your mouth. Just click share on Facebook when somebody else is sharing the gospel or on YouTube when somebody else is sharing the gospel. It's so easy. But you know, I have Christian friends that I look at their Facebook pages. You don't see anything about the Lord on them. You, you see nothing. You would not even know that they claim to be Christians. I just That just amazes me. We have the entire Word of God. We don't need to see a sign or a wonder or a miracle today, although occasionally God will bless us with one. But still, I never doubt that it happens when I hear of supernatural events happening in some countries that aren't as blessed as we are with God's Word because He will show people who are seeking Him. He will show them. He will give them a sign. He will give them something. I've heard of Muslims having dreams and coming to to Jesus that way. Uh, so it still happens, but not so much here. We, we've been too blessed with, with every bit of God's Word, like I said. Turn the TV on, you hear it. Turn the radio on, you can hear it. I'm just going to give you a few closing notes now. There's so much in this book that I, one person can never touch it all. So y'all going to have to study it a little for yourself if you really want it. <clears throat> Although we see Nebuchadnezzar does get saved in chapter 4, in the first three chapters, he is a picture of the Antichrist promoting a one-world government. And like the Antichrist, the image is a way for him to unite the people through religion. We'll see that happening in Revelation and later in the book of Daniel. We can see the number 666 and the size of the image. Notice in chapter 3 how music is used as a way to appeal to the flesh. And through the flesh... Hold on, i got to go cough. Okay, I'm back. I've still got those allergies, and like I told y'all, I uh, I don't know how to edit, and I have prayed about my pride situation, told the Lord I'm going to quit trying to redo, redo. I'm just going to give it to you like it comes, <laughs> so this is it. I may have to uh, take a break and cough again, but maybe not. I drank some water a while ago, so <laughs> anyway, okay, let's see. Notice in chapter 3 how music is used <clears throat> as a way to appeal to, to the flesh and through the flesh. Okay, I hate the devil. All right, here we go. Let me start over again. Okay. Notice in chapter 3 how music is used as a way to appeal to the flesh and through the flesh <clears throat> is always how Satan makes sin appealing to us. Yeah, Satan can mess our flesh up really bad if we allow it. Six instruments are mentioned, three different times in chapter 3. There we see <clears throat> that number 666 again. In Ezekiel 28, 13 in the King James Bible, it uh, makes us think that musical instruments might have been built into the body of Satan. Go back and read that sometime. Ezekiel 28, 13 and, and the context of those verses. <clears throat> so he might have been the heavenly choir leader on creation morning when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 38, 7. Satan desires worship. Music is a part of worship, but Satan twists God's beautiful melodies into ugly things. 
<clears throat> we know it's true. You hear some rap music when you're going down the street and their windows are down and oh my, you hear such vulgar stuff. You have to roll your windows up to try not to hear it. Satan twist what God makes beautiful into something ugly. He always tries to counterfeit what God does, but in an ugly, ungodly way. You know, King David danced before the Lord in praise to God, but Satan has people dancing around golden idols naked a lot of times. Well, I said a lot of times. I know of one time in the Bible, probably more than that. <clears throat> the kingdom of Antichrist will be connected with gold like the kingdom of Jesus Christ, counterfeiting, counterfeiting, things Jesus makes beautiful. Nebuchadnezzar's golden image was a type of the image of the beast in Revelation chapter 13. The three Hebrew children that wouldn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image are a type of the remnant of Jews in the tribulation who endure to the end and enter the kingdom age alive. Dr. Clarence Larkin ends his commentary of Daniel 3 with this. They are later seen in Revelation 15, 1 through 3, this remnant, standing on a sea of glass mingled with fire, which is a type of the fiery trials which they have passed through. They had come out of the great tribulation, for they had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark. And as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were delivered and promoted, so the Jewish remnant of the end time will be promoted and given positions of power and influence in the millennial kingdom of Christ. And that ends Daniel chapter 3. <clears throat> but I encourage you to read it, read it, read it, study it for yourself. And please share in the comments what you see that, that I missed or, or that I didn't get around to talking about. No one person can cover it all. There is so much. And it is important for us to share what we learn with each other, build each other up. God bless you in your search for the truth. Uh, when you seek it, you will find it. God promises it is so. And uh, y'all pray for me. I pray for all of my YouTube listeners. I love you all and I thank you all for, for listening to me. I look at it as a, a great big Sunday school class sitting in my living room listening. <laughs> my my uh, stepson one time said, Pam, don't you feel kind of weird listening to yourself and, and teaching your teaching that with just you there. And I said, well, no, I like to hear it because if I do it, I know God gave it to me. I'm not smart enough to get it. So um, God bless y'all, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you study it and uh, dig, dig in God's Word and get even more. Get, get even more, and please share it with me. God bless.